Okay, in this video, we're going to look very briefly at the group B streptococci, which are uh, strains of the, the species Streptococcus agalactii. Then we'll look at the pneumococcus, pneumococci, and then we'll look at, uh, very briefly, some of the oral streptococci. So group B strep tend to be beta hemolytic, so they're producing hemolysin. They have proteases that allow them to degrade proteins, such as in connective tissue. And they can even carry high aluronidase, which could at least theoretically make them highly invasive. <clears throat> you can see an image here of group B streptococci and their, uh, their typical coccus um, morphology and streptococcus arrangement. They typically have a capsule that is not made of hyaluronic acid. And because they're not made of hyaluronic acid, our immune system, uh, at least the adult immune system, has a much easier time recognizing it than the capsule of the uh, group A strep, which looks too much like self. So the non-hyaluronic acid capsule is readily detected by the adult immune system. And in a couple weeks when we talk about the immune system, we're going to see that uh, the infant immune system really struggles with recognizing um, carbohydrate or polysaccharide antigens. Now, that portion of the immune system takes time to develop. You and I can do it pretty well. Little kids, not so much. Um, so it turns out that group B strep is actually a big threat to infants and not so much a threat to adults. We'll talk about that context uh, here in just a minute. Where do they normally reside? They are part of the normal flora of the intestines and the vaginal tract of a significant percentage of women. And I don't know what that percentage is. Um, I've heard as high as one out of three, uh, but I don't know how accurate that number is. So it's a significant number of women that are group B strep positive, and it's commensal at worst. The bacteria are there minding their own business, just you know, going about life, causing no harm to you directly, partly because of that non-hyaluronic acid um, capsule that allows our immune system to keep their numbers in check. Where they pose a threat, however, <clears throat> is in newborns. So the newborn has to pass through the birth canal. If the mom is group B strep positive, the newborn gets a pretty heavy inoculum in the nose, the mouth, the eyes, potentially even in the bloodstream. And um, if that group B strep is unnoticed and therefore it's not being uh, suppressed during labor and delivery, then we have the potential for neonatal bacteremia, live bacteria in the bloodstream, meningitis, live microorganisms in the uh, cerebrospinal fluid, and pneumonia if they get into the lungs. So group B strep can cause some pretty significant infection in neonates, but fortunately in modern times we have very quick tests. We can use the Lancefield antigens on the surface, identify group B strep early on during prenatal care uh, with the mother. And if the mother is in fact group B strep positive, a note goes in the chart, and it's as simple as a suppressive uh, antibiotic during labor and delivery, and then some extra precautions when the baby comes out with antibiotics to the nose, mouth, and eyes. So group B strep can be a problem if we don't know that it's there, but as long as we can detect it, we can handle it pretty well. Now the pneumococcus. You will not hear it called Streptococcus pneumoniae in the clinic, uh, but in research labs, that's what we, how we talk about it. Clinically, they simply call it pneumococci. Pneumococci are diplococci in the genus Streptococcus, and they can be quite nasty. They have a capsule, but their capsule is very complex. From one strain to the next, they seem to have different polysaccharide capsules. Uh, at the time that I created this slide a couple of years ago, there were at least 90 unique known polysaccharide capsules. So that's, that's a lot for us to keep after with either uh, our immunological memory uh, naturally or through, um, through vaccination. That capsule, like other capsules, is going to interfere with phagocytosis. It's going to make the surface slippery. It's going to hide some of the best protein antigens. And it's also going to interfere with opsonization. So that capsule uh, buys pneumococci time to avoid our immune system. There's also a molecule on the surface called phosphorylcholine. It is a ligand, meaning a molecule that binds to something else. And it binds specifically to choline receptors. These are receptors that we find on the surface of our respiratory epithelial cells. And when it binds to them, it actually stimulates endocytosis. 
So you can sort of picture these guys sticking to cells of our respiratory tract and not only sticking there, but inducing endocytosis, kind of like ringing the doorbell. And our cells are tricked into bringing them in, unfortunately. And it's all because of this phosphorylcholine. <clears throat> Pili are short hair-like structures. They're going to be very similar to fimbriae. They emanate from the cell envelope. And they are also crucial for attachment to uh, lung epithelial cells. And so between the phosphorylcholine and the pili, these guys are very sticky, have a very high affinity for our, uh, our respiratory tract epithelium. And then they produce a cytolytic toxin. And their cytolytic toxin is called pneumolysin. Uh, it's an exotoxin that's secreted. It forms pores in literally any human cell that it comes in contact with. And in particular, it's important in lysing ciliated respiratory epithelial cells. Those ciliated cells are important for our ciliary ladder. That's what's constantly moving mucus and foreign particles up and out and protecting our, um, our lower respiratory tract. And so this pneumolysin is involved in destroying those cells, ruining that ciliary ladder, and uh, allowing the bacteria to stay nice and deep. From the name, you can tell uh, this can cause pneumonia. This is, in fact, the number one cause of bacterial pneumonia in adults. So what are the pneumococcal diseases? Sinus infection and middle ear infection, sinusitis and otitis media. In adults, uh, it tends to cause sinusitis. We don't get uh, middle ear infections very often. But in children, it tends to express as a middle ear infection and not in the sinus. So we sort of trade off somewhere around, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 years old. Pneumococcal pneumonia, so it, it, like I said, is the primary cause of bacterial pneumonia. Meningitis, so it is a, a common cause of bacterial meningitis. Both pneumonia and meningitis can be viral as well, and there are other bacteria that can cause both of them besides the pneumococcus. Bacteremia, so infection of the bloodstream, and endocarditis, uh, it likes to form biofilms on heart valves uh, and heart tissue. So if it does get into the bloodstream, it poses a threat of getting into the heart, uh, growing on the heart, and then becoming very, very difficult to get rid of. So those are the pneumococci. And then let me give you a quick uh, update or uh, uh, overview of the oral streptococci. These are sometimes called viridans, comes from the Latin for green. And it's because at least the, the early ones were all alpha hemolytic. And if you remember from an earlier slide, alpha hemolysis tends to have a greenish tint. And so they got the name viridan streptococci. We've since learned that oral streptococci, there are many of them that uh, don't produce any uh, hemolytic toxins. So viridans is, isn't the best term, but you'll still see it on standardized tests or in uh, textbooks and such. They're commonly alpha hemolytic very common in the mouth, and these are what cause dental caries or cavities. They form biofilms on our teeth, and we call those biofilms plaque, particularly once those biofilms start to get hard by recruiting calcium into them. They become calcified, and then the dentist has to get out those really nasty evil tools and scrape and dig and chip that plaque off of there to get those biofilms off the surface of your teeth. It's interesting that the that at least some species of oral streptococci, I think of strep mutans, for example, require refined sugars, things like sucrose in particular, to make the capsules that they use for their biofilms. So if you have a low sugar or no sugar diet, at least theoretically, you should be able to prevent cavities entirely because the bacteria that cause those cavities can't stick to your teeth and they're going to simply wash them off every time we swallow. So there you go. Those are the group B strep, the pneumococci, and the oral streptococci. And as always, you need to shoot me an email or talk to me after class sometime and let me know if you have any questions at all. Let's see if I can get this to stop now.